The tobacco's in the jar beside you over there. Thanks. Well, Doctor, all ready for tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure? Yes, Mr. Bartell. Though on this occasion, I'm going to tell the story a little differently. You see, I didn't take part in it myself, so I shall act as a narrator and recount the adventure as it was told me some years after it actually took place. Told you by Sherlock Holmes, I suppose. Yes. At the time the story happened, the whole world, including myself, believed that my old friend had been dead for three years. What did he do with himself during those three years, Doc? Wandered about the world, Persia, Egypt, the south of France, and two years of his time was spent in Tibet, where he disguised himself as a Norwegian explorer by the name of Sergison, his object being to visit the forbidden city of Lhasa. The story began as Holmes stood on the outskirts of a tiny encampment, high in the Tibetan snows, disguised as a Norwegian Sergison. Surrounding him was an excited group of, of native guides, their fur-capped faces and shaggy sheepskin coats, making them appear like strange, wild animals as they stood there gesticulating wildly. The freezing wind whirled great clouds of snow away from the mountaintop that loomed above them. And Holmes told me that he felt a premonition of impending disaster. Stop. My men will go no further. They say the goddess of the mountain is angry. If we climb further, she will swallow us up. She will bury us. But we cannot go back now. We have come so far, a thousand feet, eight hundred feet higher. We shall reach the pass. We shall be safe. I will not go. We can stay back there in the tent until the goddess of the mountain tells us we may go further. He is right. We can't go. We don't want to go anymore. It's too... Fools! If you stay here in the wilderness, in the village, and the avalanche comes, you will all be buried. You will be swept away. The only road lies upward. We will not go! Oh, back to the tent! The wind is rising! Then I shall go on alone! Holmes was the only one who survived. He struggled up the pass that led to safety, the icy gale whipping round him in a, in a frenzy. A few moments after he reached the top, the avalanche occurred. The tents, the guides, and all their equipment were buried beneath hundreds of feet of hurtling, thundering snow. The way behind him was closed. He could only forge ahead. Alone, unaided, he descended the path that led to the plateau beyond. But the goddess of the mountain was still angry. Through the knifing wind and snow he battled on, without food and without, as he told me later, much hope. Even Holmes was helpless in that battle of man against the elements. What happened in that 36 hours, he never really knew, except that the wind howled and the driving snow slashed at him without mercy. Finally, his mind began to wander, and he became delirious. Watson, dear boy, hand me my violin, will you? Moriarty, I want to introduce to you the goddess of the mountain. I think you'll have a lot in common. 221 B Baker Street, Cabby, for heaven's sake, get me as fast as you can. I think I've caught a chill. Though his mind was wandering, his great strength combined with instinctive urge for self-preservation must have kept on his feet. But finally, he returned to normal consciousness to find himself jogging along a rough road in a primitive cart drawn by two oxen. The sun shining on him and a white girl feeding him warm broth from a cup. For a moment, the girl looked at him with a comforting smile. And then she spoke. No wonder you look puzzled, poor man. You can't make up your mind whether you're in this world or the next. Who are you? And how did I get here, please? My name is Eileen Farley. I'm a medical missionary. I found you wandering out of your mind two days ago. And I've taken you under my wing. We're going to the monastery of Pancha Pushpa. I'm most grateful to you, Miss Farley. You have saved my life. Permit me to introduce myself. My name is Sigerson, Olaf Sigerson. I'm a Norwegian explorer. <laughs> oh, no. No, your name is Sherlock Holmes, and you're a famous oh, English detective. Please, I don't understand. You. Mr. Holmes, you've been delirious for the last two days. 
In your ravings, I was delighted to learn that the great Sherlock Holmes did not die two years ago at the Reichenbach Falls. I can see that further simulation is useless, my dear young lady. However, I must implore you to keep my secret. It's essential that for a while longer, the world continues to think me dead. You don't need to worry, Mr. Holmes. I'm a great admirer of yours, and I promise that no one will ever learn your secret from my lips. Try drinking a little more broth. You're uh, dreadfully weak. Thank you, sir. Help me, please. Please, to give me help. Another white man travels the road to Pancha Pushpa. Stop the cart! You need help? Stop! Ah, ah, my own cart has broken the wheel. We're going perhaps to the monastery of Pancha Pushpa. We are? Ah, good. <laughs> Pyotr Dmitrievich Borodin, Imperial Russian envoy, will travel with you. Uh, please to make room. Uh, as possible. Oh, uh, remember my secret. Uh, the cart may proceed. Ponimoesh! <laughs> Uh, your name, please, young lady. Irene Farley. I'm an American medical missionary. Well, I do not approve of missionaries, but uh, you are very beautiful. So Borodin will forgive you. <laughs> Who is this magic lying on the floor? He looks half dead. I am half dead, Grosbody Borodin. My name is Sigerson. I am Norwegian. What is a Norwegian doing in Tibet? I have been exploring the mountains. And what, may I ask, is a Russian doing in Tibet, Gospodin Borodin? What is a Russian doing? <laughs> you shall see, my friend. To Holy Mother Russia shall belong Tibet. But now let us be gay. We have some hours ahead of us. You uh, like vodka, Miss Farley? I'm afraid I don't drink. <laughs> Borodin will teach you to drink. Then he will sing you songs of his native Russia. Uh, we shall be happy. <laughs> Ay, chiki, 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 gor, vashnim, or a diakri. Singing. Holmes told me that every note jarred his aching, weary head. After a few hours, the strangely assorted trio arrived at the gates of the monastery. An edifice, as Holmes told me, of great antiquity and of breathtaking beauty, and built in the shadow of a giant mountain. He was fed and bathed, and shortly afterwards, he found himself together with his two companions in the presence of the head abbot himself, a man of great age and infinite wisdom. The faint chanting of religious music could be heard coming from another part of the monastery. As the old man... <laughs> my dear Miss Farley, my dear gentlemen, I have welcomed you to the monastery, and yet each one of you has come to me separately and asked that he be given permission to go to the sacred city of Lhasa. I cannot give that permission, my children. Borodin has traveled a long way. Russia will be most unhappy if he does not get the permission. I am an explorer, Reverend Sir. Will not that fact entitle me to some consideration? I, too, have traveled a great way, sir. My children, I realize your claims, but the permission is not in my power to grant. Tibet is ruled by our Chinese overlords. In any case, I will ask you to turn your heads. The gentleman approaching us has preceded you in residence here. He also wishes to tread the road to Lhasa. You have new visitors, I see. Yes, my son. Permit me. To introduce you, Sir Harvey Forrester, and this is Miss Eileen Farley. How do you do? How do you do, Sir Harvey? Gospodin Borodin from Russia. How do you do? One cannot travel the world without meeting an Englishman. God we push it, what's it? And Mr. Olaf Sigerson from Norway. God dark, Sir Harvey. How do you do? Please be seated. My children... The Chinese ruler in this province has heard of your presence here. He has announced his intention of visiting you. Before he arrives, I should like to ask you each a question. Four of you, all from different countries, have traveled here to the mountains of Tibet. At this monastery, I can offer you refreshment, the opportunity of acquiring wisdom and peace. What more do you seek in Lhasa? I shall ask you each that question in turn. You, Miss Farley, what do you seek? I seek the opportunity to bring both God and health to your Tibetan people. And you, Mr. Seegerson? I seek to chart the true course of your mountains, and so to bring knowledge to the world. And you, 
Gospodin Borodin. I seek to bring about complete understanding between the great peoples of Tibet and Russia. If I succeed, Tsar and his family may consider turning to Buddhism. Indeed. And you, Sir Harvey, as representative of the British government, what do you seek? I shall not join in this contest of wishful thinking. I merely remind you, sir, that your government has signed a treaty with mine. And was not that treaty forced upon us by our Chinese overlords? No, my children. You have advanced brave reasons, but I cannot help remembering that the streams of Tibet bear gold nuggets the size of hazelnuts. You foreigners, in your pitiful ignorance, esteem gold. Uh, that signals the arrival of Hua Tsun, the Chinese emissary. Your problems will soon be settled, my children. I will acquaint him with your request. Mm. Why are you smiling, Mr. Holmes? At the name of the Chinese overlord, Wat Sun. Must avoid falling into old habits and saying, Elementary, my dear, Wat Sun. Shh, shh, he's going to speak. Silence! Silence! The abbot has told me your wishes. I will hold conference. American lady and Norwegian will not be allowed. Only Great Britain and Russia have treaties with my country. I insist that I have prior right over the Russian representative. George Vosme, I represent the Tsar, and Russia is your neighbor. I demand my diplomatic privilege. Follow me. I will decide these things, not you. I shall inform the British consul in Peking if proceedings. This is an insult to the Tsar. Only Mother Russia will never... Well, Mr. Holmes, never. it looks as if you and I, at any rate, don't get to Lhasa. No. You look worried. Does the journey to Lhasa mean so much to you? It isn't that. I'm worried about the potential danger that hangs over this monastery. Violent forces are at work. What do you mean, Mr. Holmes? As you know, Miss Farley, I have some specialized acquaintance with these matters, and I tell you that I have rarely seen more clearly exemplified that emotional tension which leads to one thing. Murder. That is what I'm afraid of, young lady. Murder. Uh, no. That was what Holmes was afraid of. Later that day, as the sun was setting over the mountaintop, the old abbot walked slowly in the monastery gardens as he talked to the man who he thought would be Seagus. Oh, Mr. Seagus, and what can I do to help you? Our conversation has pleased me. You are a man of rare perception and knowledge. I grant you one worthy to enter, Lhasa, but I can offer no hope. Mr. Wa has already rejected the applications of both the Englishman and the Russian. He did that, he did, my son. He told me they were both very angry and threatened him. If anything were to uh, to happen to the Chinese emissary, would you have the right to grant permission for the journey to Lhasa? Yes, until the new envoy arrived in Peking. But what are you suggesting, my son? This monastery is a haven of peace, a backwater far from the troubled stream of life. No violence has ever occurred here. I hope it never will, yet... The Chinese envoy was threatened, you say, Reverend Sir? Yes, my son. He has left the monastery, of course. No, those who come here, even for a short visit, must break bread with us and sleep at least one night. Mr. Wa is quartered in the cell you see before us. Then do you mind if we call on him, Reverend Sir? Of course not, my son, though you will not waste your breath in talking to him. He will not give you permission to take the road to Lhasa. He sleeps, my son. Let us not disturb him. If you don't mind, Reverend Sir, I must waken him. If he can be wakened. What can be wrong? I think I know. I'm going in. There is your answer, Reverend Sir. He is dead. Yes, sir. Strangled with his own cue. Oh. Poor misguided man has taken his own life, my son. No, sir. Look at those marks on his shoulder. He has been murdered. But what are we to do? As it happens, Reverend Sir, I had a certain amount of experience with these matters in my in my own country. If I were to produce the murderer for you with certain proof of his guilt, would you authorize my going to Lhasa? Yes, since for a few days that mission is mine to give, I will grant it. You fill me with a strange confidence, but... How will you find this taker of life? I can't tell you now, sir, but I shall find him. 
All that I require is a little assistance from you, sir. Of course. What is it? Let us both leave the cell, post a guard here, and give him strict orders that no one is to enter unless accompanied by me. Very well. But, my son, where are you going? Before very long, sir, I hope to be on my way to Lhasa. <laughs> But I, I wasn't there. So this time he enlisted the services of Eileen Farley, the American girl. Immediately after he'd left the cell of the murdered man, he'd gone to Miss Farley and told her of the tragedy. As they returned to the scene of the crime, he found that his instructions had been carried out and that a guard was barring the entrance to the dead man's cell. There's a guard in front of the cell. My instructions. The abbot gave you your orders. Yes, you may go in. Please close the door behind us. I'm sure your nerves are up to this, Miss Farley. It's not a pretty sight. I've seen sudden death before, Mr. Holmes. In any case, I would dare appear frightened. I'm so flattered that you asked me to help you. You were the only one who knew my true identity. That's why I suggest that you take my old friend's place. I need, what shall I say? I needed uh, a sounding, sounding board for my deductions. Wait a minute, here. I'll light a match. There we are. Now, here's a candle. <gasps> oh! I warned you it wasn't a pretty sight. Hold the candle, will you please, Miss Farley? Thank you. <gasps> this isn't hard to reconstruct. The killer stood behind his victim, held him by the left shoulder. So, wound his cue around his neck and pulled back. Yes, yes. The marks are self-evident. Hello. What's this on the floor? His feet. A cigarette. Dropped as it was burning, I should think. And now it's nothing but ash. Exactly, ash. Now, which of the visitors at the monastery smoke cigarettes? Uh, yourself? The Russian and Sir Harvey, the Englishman. I think we may justifiably omit myself from the list of suspects, so that narrows us down to two. Look, Miss Farley. What is it? There are clear traces here to the naked eye, not only of tobacco, ash, and paper, but of, of cardboard. But what does that signify, Mr. Holmes? Well, the case is nearly solved. Come on, young lady. We must pay a visit to Borodin cell at once. <laughs> Always, Sir Harvey Forrester, you give me the argument. But, my dear Borodin... I am not your dear Borodin. I'm Pyotr Dmitrovich Borodin, ambassador of Holy Mother Russia. I'm no friend of yours. Come in, come in, come in. Ah, oh, huh. the missionary girl and the sick Norwegian. Come in. We will drink vodka, and I will sing Russian songs for you. We haven't come here to listen to songs. The Chinese envoy was murdered tonight. Oh, so we have been told, my dear. Sir Harvey and I are very happy because of his death, are we not? Well, I won't pretend I'm heartbroken. Rasputin Borodin. What is it, Norwegian? You were in the cell tonight at the time of the murder. Huh? That's a lie. I can prove it. In that cell, I just found ashes, a totally burned cigarette, ashes that included fragments of cardboard. Only a Russian cigarette has a cardboard mouthpiece. What you can or cannot prove is of no interest to me, Sigerson. He's very obstinate tonight, Sigerson. We've just been having a political argument. Couldn't agree on a single point, except on the danger of the common man. He was telling me of the most extraordinary revolution in his estates. Do you know they chop off one of his hands? Oh, dreadful. Your hand, Borodin. Which, which one? Uh, as God was merciful, uh, my left hand. Then the one beneath your glove? He's made of wax, my good Norwegian. He's made of wax. Mercy for yourself. Extraordinary. It's more than that. It is conclusive proof. What do you mean, Mr. Seekerson? I cannot tell you now. I must leave you here. Let me warn you, the three of you will be well advised to keep an eye on each other. Meanwhile, I must see the abbot. Why, Mr. Seekerson? Because now I know who murdered Vat Sun. of dawn are stealing across the mountain top, my son. Soon you will be on your way to Lhasa. Yes, Reverend Sir. You have kept your promise. You kept yours, Mr. Sigerson. The Chinese soldiers have arrived and the taker of life has been given into their custody. Before you leave, my son, I want you to do something for me. Anything, Reverend Sir. What is it? The hooded figure in the corner is that of the monastery scribe. He keeps our annals. I want you to explain for our records how you knew 
Which one of the three was the taker of life? It was not difficult, sir. The killer had gripped Vatsun's shoulder with the left hand, while right was used to strangle him. Therefore, the Russian Borodin could not be the killer, since his left hand was artificial. Quite so. It was, as you told me, made of wax. Then... But the clue of the cigarette pointed directly to the Russian. Therefore, it had obviously been planted there deliberately to incriminate him. Now, there is no trained police force in Tibet. We need no police. There is no crime here, my son. But continue. Why should the cigarette be planted to incriminate the Russian? Unless there was someone capable of making the deduction from a handful of cigarette ash. Therefore, the murderer was the one person who knew my true identity. Miss Eileen Farley, a supposed missionary. No missionary, as it transpired when she confessed. No American. No. A secret service agent of America, of German origin, seeking to reach Lhasa before the Russians. And I'm furiated by Watson's denial of passage. Any secret service is better off without such employee. She will pay for her mortal sins. May she redeem herself in her next place on the wheel. My son. Yes, Reverend, sir. You are about to leave me, and I shall never see you again. Though evil and death came to Panchapushpa and to my monastery in the caravan that brought you here, I shall miss you, my son. I shall miss you greatly. And I you, Reverend Sir. Would you consider staying here? I can only offer you peace, a shelter from the outside world, and quiet companionship. Ah, three great gifts, sir. But I cannot take them. My work is not done. I must go on. Of course, my son. It was an old man's dream. One last question. What is it, sir? You spoke of your true identity just now. Who are you, my son? Reverend sir, I cannot tell even you the answer to that question. One day, perhaps, but not now. Let us just say that I have wandered through a world of trouble, just as you have remained tranquil in a world of peace. I hope, sir, that we shall meet again. I hope so, too. Goodbye, my son. Goodbye, Reverend sir. Goodbye.